The one thing I remember, and I'm going to be walking around a little bit, the one thing I remember being told when I came here last year was really reach out and meet new people. So I want to reiterate what Katie just said. Uh, these, I mean, you guys are rock stars, rock stars of vaccine communication. And it, it's just amazing to be in this room with all these uh, really amazing people. So first off, a huge thank you. Uh, I'm going to, my French, je parle un peu français, uh, but I want to thank Le Pensier, uh, the Mayor Yu Foundation, and the organizing committee for the um, Vaccine Acceptance Conference for um, inviting me to speak. I am beyond humbled. So, um, I'm not going to pen a mine, but I have something to start off the conference with. Okay, that would be a cheap, cheap joke, so I, will, I only went for it for a second. Thank you for Angus filling in because it was buffering. Okay, <laughs> please shut your phones off now. There we go. All right. So, yes, um, I am Todd Woolin. I am uh, a pediatrician, and um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about myself. But um, this is what we're calling our Shots Heard Around the World Tour uh, 2019. So... Uh, First disclosure, I certainly have done work and continue to do work with Merck and Sanofi. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. First, my vaccine path. Uh, I've been in primary care for 25 years, um, 14 years in clinical vaccine research, over 10 years really focused on quality measures. I have a medical degree, that's the MD, so I wear a white coat sometimes. Um, I'm clinical about 30% of the time. Um, I, I'm also a board, international board certified lactation consultant, so sometimes you'll see me walking down the hall with a boppy pillow to help moms breastfeed. And um, I also went back and got a master of medical management, MMM, um, so sometimes I wear a sports coat. Um, so uh, that's the business side. So I'm about 70% administrative. And um, as Katie referenced when we were talking over dinner, I feel like I have the best job in the world because I get to work on innovative solutions, networking, and thinking about how to help patients in ways we may not currently be doing so. Um, so the story's gonna go, um, this vaccine saga is a, a two year ongoing crazy ride. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit how, how it happened, but first I have to tell you a little bit about our practice, kids plus pediatrics. So we're, um, we're fiercely independent. We're not owned by a hospital or an insurance company. Um, we're pretty darn entrepreneurial. Um, we're communication obsessed. So even before I was here last year, we were already communication obsessed. Um, and, and the story will go like this. Hi there, I'm Dr. Todd Wolin, CEO of Kids Plus Pediatrics here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Kids Plus Pediatrics is a fiercely independent, physician-owned general pediatric practice. We have three offices, 22 providers, and about 95 employees. We're a level three NCQA patient center medical home. We won the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award 2016, and we were voted as a top workplace by the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette for five of the past six years. Seven of the last eight years now. At Kids Plus, we believe to be a pediatrician is to be an advocate. Many of our families will face healthcare challenges we cannot affect in the exam room. These include social determinants of health, like housing insecurity, food insecurity, healthcare access, poverty, education, and transportation. At Kids Plus, we believe to our core in the power of communication. So if I leave you with one takeaway today, it's to become a better communicator. We believe so much in this concept that at Kids Plus, we have a full-time communications director. His name's Chad Herman, and he was the first full-time pediatric communication director that we know of. And if you find that surprising, you're probably gonna be shocked to find out that one of the most important rooms in our office is our production studio. So think about it, you know lots of smart people and you've heard them lecture to you, you know, doctors and scientists and physicians, and sometimes they lose your interest. Sometimes you're just falling asleep in the back of the lecture hall. The point here is experts aren't always good communicators. The key isn't expertise, it's the ability to communicate that expertise and then to get people to act on it. Now that is advocacy. 
So let me give you just a few examples of our Kids Plus communication and advocacy. One more. One more. All right, let me set the scene for you, right? It is fall of 2017, and CHIP reauthorization has floundered. There's no funding. Well, this is where Kids Plus steps up and is heard. Wow. And do uh, Dr. Wolin, uh, yeah. can you speak to this in the planning process? Uh, because it, it, it seems obviously uh, counterproductive for Congress to do this in a way that adds uncertainty that otherwise wouldn't be there. Yeah, Ari, the uncertainty is the key. I, I don't know what to tell families. I, I, Ariel and I have talked before, and I don't know what to tell them. Usually, if it's a matter of getting help for a child that needs uh, care for a developmental issue or an acute illness or cancer, right? Um, I have additional resources for families. CHIP is that fallback plan, that additional resource. There's no backup to CHIP. Mm. So families that don't make enough uh, to have a good health plan and make too much to get Medicaid, this is the backup mm -hmm. plan. Mm -hmm. If you get rid of this, there's literally nothing. Uh, I have nothing to offer her or any other family who says, what do we do now? I, I don't know what to tell them. Yeah. Go Governor. So here we are. Now we're headed into early 2018 and still no CHIP funding. So Kids Plus asks our families to advocate with us. Hi there. It's Dr. Wolin. You may have noticed over the last several weeks that the national media, such as NPR, The New York Times, LA Times, and MSNBC, have come to Kids Plus to ask us about CHIP, the Children's Health Insurance Program, which serves over 9 million children nationally. They wanted to know how CHIP was impacting our practice, but more importantly, they wanted to know how CHIP was impacting our families. So we want to hear your stories. How has CHIP helped you? Do you know any friends or family that rely on CHIP? How has it helped them? So tell us your story in the comments below, or private message us, or even make a video. Because we believe the more that your stories get told, the greater the chance that CHIP will get reauthorized to help children and families in need. Thank you. So that video, uh, part of that, this was part of a little bit of a bigger video, was requested that the American Academy of Pediatrics asked, asked us to make this on advocacy for teaching residents on how to advocate. Now this is a vaccine conference but the woman you saw there was a mother in our practice. And it was kind of like harmonic convergence for me when I came here last year in the fall, because it was a few months later uh, after I made this uh, video in our, in our studio that I started meeting all of you people and got to hear about the power of narrative and storytelling. The, the longer version of that is that mother in front of national media started to tell everybody how much her budget was for food each month. And if the insurance plan wasn't there, how it would devastate her family. I started realizing how powerful narrative and storytelling was, and we were asked by everybody in the national media, as you saw, to speak on this. And we realized we had catched, caught lightning in a bottle. Um, and so I wanted to do more with it, and then I came here, and I was like, like, what could we do about vaccines if we took that same kind of pediatrician family story and leveraged it? Um, so we serve, uh, we have three offices. We serve suburban and urban and rural populations, higher, middle, and lower socioeconomic groups. Um, we see people and engage them both physically and virtually. And what we have in common, regardless of what country you're in, where we are involved in the vaccine process. I understand that that's different from country to country. We actually give the vaccines in our office. I understand in other places, maybe it's the general practitioner, but that's something we have in common um, here. Uh, but we do weave communication through everything we do, and we now really recognize that we have an impact on public health beyond the doors of our practice. We've been very involved in research, uh, 14 years, as I said, for clinical vaccine research, but we've now started digging into communication research. And because we're really good at business, uh, again, I went back for a business degree. My partner, who's the CFO, who likes spreadsheets in Excel, he lives in Excel. I live in PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> anything from a banker, lawyer, accountant goes to his desk. Um, but we're really good at turning things around. We can do PDSA cycles, but we also look at it from a business standpoint, which we think makes us a little bit different. Um, and so we can go peer to peer, physician to physician. We can go business person to business person. The notion of a living lab is if we can think something up that's gonna benefit families and the CFO says it won't break the bank, he says try it. And we're, we're pretty successful. We're hyper collaborative. There's actually nobody that I can think of that couldn't be a partner with us and we're constantly engaging people, which again, I think helps so in pediatrics, we think a lot of people view, of it, view it like this, but at Kids Plus, we think of uh, pediatrics like this. 
And again, uh, built with, to connect and impact, um, hyper collaborative, and again, pretty successful at what we do. Um, in one slide, at least in the United States, this is what we found has been a real problem with pediatrics in that pediatrics has reduced itself to checking boxes, maybe giving immunizations um, and taking measurements. And so you come in for your well visit or you come in with symptoms and we have to decide, do you need a prescription for an antibiotic or to go to an emergency room? Um, and, and if you reduce yourself to just this box checking electronic medical record system function, you lose and squander the most important, most priceless thing that there is. The thing that you saw in that video, a mom who she and I both talked about her kids and told the cameras and both interacted with each other. And that's because in primary care, you build this, which is a longitudinal trusted relationship. It's built on trust and it goes for decades. And if you see siblings, it can go on for two or three decades. And it, now that I'm getting older, I see kids of kids I used to see. And my older partner is seeing three generations of kids. This is an immense source of power that we squander and don't use to tell people stories about what it is that affects them and the infectious disease and vaccine preventable disease that we don't talk about with immunizations. So in Kids Plus, we don't believe that your interaction in the office that you're gonna be able to impart all the knowledge that you need to. Obviously that kid's probably crying. There might be another sibling running around the floor. Um, so we believe very much in this notion of multimodal immersion. Um, and so I'll give you just a couple more examples of what that looks like. Um, the first rule of communication, know your audience. At Kids Plus, the second rule is how to reach them. And if you're not here, you're not on the radar. <laughs> Millennials live here. And so we talk to practices all the time in the United States and say, if you don't have some type of virtual presence, they really don't regard you as kind of being on their radar. So um, we really doubled down and went on to several social media platforms starting nine years ago and our latest evolution is Kids Plus. And now we have a reach into the tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands. Um, we believe in this so much so that as you heard, we have a production studio. We actually are launching a podcast. We already recorded our first episode. Um, and it doesn't require hundreds of thousands of dollars to do this, but it, it did require an investment. Um, we also learned a little bit even from this conference last year when I went back and said, you know, why are we showing the pictures of the scary needles every time? Um, that, that maybe that isn't connoting what, what we wanted to. Um, that's making me feel bad and sad. And sometimes it's a horse needle filled with yellow stuff that I don't even know what's going in that kid's arm. Um, and, then, and then, you know, as Angus Thompson kept pointing out to me, he goes, you know, if you, if you like buy a Mercedes Benz or something, they don't show you looking at the bill. <laughs> like, right? They, they usually show you like, hey, I got a set of keys. I'm going to the beach. Um, and so maybe it's, it's good to show the happy, healthy side of vaccination. Um, just a little communication thing that I picked up. Uh, so, so let me just show you a couple quick, these are 30 second uh, segments of what we've done. This was um, the American Academy of Pediatrics asking for short videos on hashtag why I vax. In 1971 in Miss Haney's kindergarten class, some friends and I gave each other cootie shots to prevent the girls in the class from giving us cooties. I've since learned that cooties aren't real but pertussis, measles, and HPV are, and so are the shots that prevent them. In 2018, at Kids Plus, my friends and I give amazing vaccines that prevent disease and death. I'm proud to vaccinate children. I can't protect them from cooties, but I can and do protect them from a whole lot worse. So we like to use humor, and there's nothing wrong with engaging and entertaining when educating. And so we use that a lot. Um, here's another short one. Uh, this was our flu vaccine campaign last year. I got it. I got it. I got it. I always get it. I got it and I give it. I'm getting it right now. I don't like shots. The flu vaccine is the best way to protect kids. And adults. From the flu virus. Flu is common. It's nasty. And it can be deadly. Even in healthy children. So get the flu vaccine. It's the best protection you can get. Get it. Got it. Good. So 30 seconds again, a flu vaccine um, video that included physicians, nurse practitioners, medical assistants. The whole point of that vaccine video was to just let our families know, because that's our audience, they're the parents of our kids, that we're out here and we're actually getting ourselves um, and we all give it and we think it's the right thing to do. Um, now, 
the crazy ride that I told you that started two years ago started because of this. And so in 2017, the CDC had listed in, um, the HPV vaccine as a top five priority because of its underutilization. And the fact that we had a generation of people that didn't have to be infected or, nor get sick with nor die from HPV disease. I mean, it wasn't gonna prevent every case, but it was really good at preventing a lot of disease and we weren't utilizing it well. So this isn't such a funny video, but it was meant to be more poignant and you'll see what I mean. I prevent cancer. I prevent cancer. I prevent cancer. Together, we can prevent cancer in your children. The human papillomavirus is highly infectious. And deadly. That's right, HPV kills because HPV causes cancer. Over 600,000 cases each year. The virus spreads through intimate touching. Just one finger is all it takes to get infected. One touch, one time. We can stop those infections. We can prevent those cancers. We can save those lives. We can save your child's life. With the HPV vaccine for girls and boys. It's safe and effective. It only takes two doses. It's been working for more than 10 years, and it can prevent thousands of deaths each year. For the vaccine to work, your child has to be vaccinated before being exposed to the virus. We recommend the first dose between ages 9 and 11. But the sooner the better, because all it takes is one touch, one time. When children enter their teens, they have a greater risk of being exposed to HPV. Every year. Every day. Every touch. But we can protect them. Get your child's HPV immunization started now. Call us in the office and make an appointment today. I prevent cancer. I prevent cancer. I prevent cancer. I prevent cancer. And you can too. So, the audience was Kids Plus Families. Um, we posted it on August 23rd, a couple years ago, and it was awesome. People were calling up our office. They were saying, that was awesome. I got to get my kid a HPV vaccine appointment. And they were making appointments and they were giving us all sorts of love. And we had 15,000 views on our Facebook page. Um, and it was, it was just awesome. Um, and then three weeks later, bum, 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 uh, this shows up. Is this some kind of joke? This vaccine kills people. So you can guess where this story is about to go. Um, it, it was the crazy ride that I have told you about. And I'll cut to the end of just the first six days of the attack, whereupon there were 808 attackers who had posted over 10,000 times to our Facebook page. They also went after in coordinated fashion globally to attack our, um, try to attack our Facebook, Yelp, and Google ratings. There were actually moles, pro-vaccine people inside these anti-vaccine groups. This anti-vaccine group was mainly driven by Sherry Tempany's group. Um, and they were sending us screenshots from inside saying, oh, dude, you better get ready. This, they're coming to get you. And they were. They were literally sharing our um, website, our phone numbers, our, all our social media sites. And then the attacks occurred. At first, you know, it seemed like it was uh, our, our, our uh, communications director sent me a text, sent me a text and said, oh, this is kind of fun. One, uh, two found it. This is kind of fun. Um, but it stopped being fun uh, when it got really uh, incredibly nasty. Um, I told you that they attacked our um, social media ratings. That is, is really important, particularly in 2019. Um, and I will tell you that our Google ratings, uh, our reviews, it was 344 days until the final fraudulent reviews were removed from our page. There's no way to call Google. There's no way to email Google, even if you own your site. Um, we finally found a back door through my Google biz, uh, dot biz Twitter handle where we, pawned, we got like a canned response and it took two or three months and then they eliminated one third without any clear explanation. Even though they had asked us, well, where's the, what server? Give us the IP address. We're like, it's our server that we own or our address on your server. You should know where it is, but here it is. Then we sent them screenshots. Here's the fraudulent attacks. Then we sent them pictures from within the site showing them colluding to leave fraudulent reviews. And some of those were still left up, including a woman from like Queensland, Australia, who we're pretty sure doesn't bring her kids to Pittsburgh for ear checks. Um, 
But the good news is they all went away. Um, we got a third more gone. It took three more months. So six months, two thirds are gone. But it almost was a year later before everything was gone. But we have an easy solution now. We know what it took. One, global measles endemics. And two, uh, an international article in The Guardian. And then all your negative reviews will go away. So I strongly recommend that's our solution. So really, it's a good thing. Little tip for you guys out there. Um, so this is, this is something that's not yet being addressed. Um, we know about anti-vaccine harassment, bullying, and threats. But this new coordinated intent to reputation smear and harm is really important. If you're hungry tonight and you want to get a good croissant, I hope my, my accent's going okay on that, uh, and you see a shop and it's one star, and you see another place that sells croissant, two doors down and they're four and a half stars, I think you know where you're going, unless you really are like, why does that place get one star croissant reviews? No, you go right to the four and a half star. And they know this. And so as a result, I will tell you the eroding confidence that we see that comes from these attacks is fear. And this is not just independent practices. I've seen groups get devastated that are one, two doc practices, but we also know a quaternary huge pediatric hospital system in a very large state in the United States that has nine communication staff, and they called us asking us for advice because their CEO and CFO said, no more video posts, or no, no more vaccine posts. No more vaccine posts, because they don't want to get attacked. And the nine communications people were like, that's really wrong. Can you give us some advice to go back and to talk to them, which our communications director did. And it took at least two months, two months before we saw them post something on vaccines again. Guess who fills that void? So we took damage. Um, we took damage from a variety of rating and review systems. The Facebook, uh, the very first hit that we got that was negative, we shut off the rating system. Those have since changed as a result, uh, or have since changed anyway. But Google reviews are pretty much the same, and Yelp reviews are pretty much the same, and you can't shut them off. Um, they're out there to be starred or fraudulently starred. Yelp, I can tell you, quick story. Do you remember when the dentist from Western Pennsylvania in the United States, yes, my state, I'm very sad to say this, lures a lion off the reservation and kills it. Cecil the lion. What happens internationally is that people, rightfully so, are outraged and they descend on his practice in Yelp and devastate his practice. As a result, Yelp has now created something called a vigilante protocol. They put it into action. They put a banner once it's reported of suspicious activity. And within two weeks, they had gotten rid of every fraudulent review, including the few people that put five-star reviews to kind of try and balance out the fraudulent reviews on our site. Um, that was amazing. Yelp lives and dies by the reviews, right? That's what they do. If you go to a restaurant, you know, you, you better have accurate reviews. Google, not so much, right? They don't seem to really care. Um, and you saw how hard it was to get rid of them. Uh, they're fraudulent reviews. So we really believe from a vaccine acceptance standpoint and a confidence standpoint and a recommendation standpoint, this strategy used by anti-vaxxers is really sharp and smart and impactful in a, in a pretty negative way and we think needs to be addressed. So it took money and time to rebuild reputation for us, but now that we were healed up, we said, and we did this within about, mm, once the process started, just a few weeks into the attack said, it really stinks to be a victim. There, um, we weren't going to be the last victim. We had seen other places, a couple, one other really large-scale glo global attack, and it, um, it did not result in them kind of getting help for other people. And other people that were getting attacked, even large systems were licking their wounds and kind of crawling away. We said this isn't going to work. Um, there need to be better resources out there. And, you know, this was kind of our rally cry to fight back, but we said they picked on the wrong group. So we launched a four-prong counter-response. Um, it includes these things, which I'm going to walk through one by one. First was we wanted some academic rigor. Um, we thought we'd be taken a little more seriously. We teamed up with the University of Pittsburgh School, Graduate School of Public Health and their Center for Media Technology and Health, uh, research on uh, me media technology and health, and got an article published in Vaccine in March of 2009. The initial work um, uh, actually came up with a Venn diagram that looked like this, you know, showing how the, the interrelatedness from these groups that coalesced all around anti-vaccine. I actually talked to one of the, uh, the, the young researchers there that I'm standing next to. That's the lead author, Beth Hoffman. Um, this young researcher, she, uh, I, I've never shown her picture actually before, but I, within this context, I thought it'd be okay. Um, 
she, she, uh, she's got a cool name. So uh, that's my kid. She was a, a high school senior. Um, and, and so, um, yeah, I thought it was pretty neat. And what they ended up showing was the interrelationship between very diametrically opposed groups that came together around anti-vaccine. Um, and so uh, what we saw was, uh, now they did a cross-section of about, I think it was 200 and some out of the 800 attackers. But from the raw data, we, we saw it was like 95% female, bimodal distribution of um, ages uh, 20, it was like uh, 18 to 20 four and like over 65, um, self-reported as under or uneducated, um, but politically all over the place. Um, the typical camps you see the arguments fall into are purity or liberty. Um, in this paper, we further broke them down into like alternatives and safety under purity and trust and conspiracy. So we got an academic article out of this. Um, but then we said, you know what? Um, here's what the attack looked like. Started on a Friday, starts really going through uh, Saturday and Sunday. Everybody's really rested by Monday, which is great, because they come out in full force. There's like 321 attackers that day. And some of the accounts post prolifically, like 100 times per day. We didn't detect any bots, um, nor did we detect Russians. I, I, I would have told my mom, I didn't know when I joined pediatrics I'd be going to, to war, uh, but uh, that, that there was bots and things like that to fight. But, but what that blue arrow represents is when the when the reinforcements came. So I happened to be at the American Academy of Pediatrics during the attack. I'm walking down the hall, I'm talking to Paul Offit, I'm talking to other people, I'm sending emails out, and um, groups started to come to our aid, um, including this amazing group called Physician Moms Group, 60,000 Strong International, and they start attacking the attackers with, with data and explicatives. Um, and, and what we saw is when the attackers started getting attacked, they started just going away. And we've since seen that in other, other attacks. Um, and so we said, we want to recreate that. Um, we want to be able to light the signal fires of Gondor and have the Riders of Rohan come in there and like, you know, attack the trolls. Um, and so we decided to create Shots Heard Around the World. Um, it actually, uh, we got a Twitter page up and a closed Facebook page up about a month or two ago. And we started vetting people. So it's a private group. We don't publish the people that are in this. They're vetted. We um, send them a Google, or a, I'm sorry, a, a monkey, a survey monkey, and they have to fill it out. We look at their past track record. And once they um, are vetted, then they join, and then they'll get the alerts when we find out there's an attack going on. So here's the Twitter page. Um, there's the closed Facebook page. And on the 18th, just a few days ago, we uh, took the placeholder off the website and actually have a live website that's up and running called shotsherd.com. Uh, so it, uh, I thought I had it in there. So it's www.shotsherd.com. And um, it is up and it is running. And I just uh, tweeted about it too. Um, but even cooler, so that, oh, even cooler, that's two things done. The third thing is the toolkit. So what we said was, people really need something, some, some knowledge base to fight off these attacks. Because as it was happening with us, we didn't have any reference. And so what we created was a reference that's free, that is going live, I think, like 30 minutes ago. Um, and it will live on shotsherd.com. Um, and it helps you prepare, defend, and clean up after these attacks. Um, it is about 80 pages. Um, it literally has help regardless of what's going on. So you could, yeah, 80 pages, who's gonna read that while you're in the midst of the attack? You don't have to. It has the story of our story. It has a little bit of the philosophy. But if you're in the midst of an attack, it has single page crisis management instructions. Like if you're attacked on Facebook, here's Facebook. Go to step one, step two, step three, step four, or Yelp or Google. And any of the strategies we learned, it talks about as well. It's a living document. It's been edited and revised already three times or four times to take up the changes that are happening on these social media platforms. This is the table of contents, but you don't really need to look at it because you can go onto the website tonight and see it. So three things done. The, four, the fourth was, I'm sorry, fourth was an awareness campaign. We wanted people to know what these attacks were doing because all the changes that you hear going on right now aren't necessarily addressing the attacks. So within the first 18 months, we've gotten out to over 2,500 attendees, both international, national, and even uh, local and regional in our area. Um, because of this conference and a couple of the other um, really fortunate uh, um, presentations and invitations I've had, 
I've been able to physically go to some of these places um, that you see listed here, but also connect virtually to people all over the world, which is why I implore you to talk to people during the breaks and get to know who they are because the expertise and the mentorship they bring and the advice is, is it's, it's irreplaceable. It's, it's really precious. Um, we did make it into national media and international media. So the Guardian article was the one that really kicked it off. But then the cover of the LA Times and Washington Post, if you don't know Dog MD, he is this really um, uh, sacrilegious, pretty irreverent, but very huge social media influencer who's actually a doc, but he's a comedian. He's a singer. He has 1.4 million followers on Facebook. And um, I sent him an email, like, here's all the stuff we're doing. And um, he said, dude, come on the show. And I'm like, all right. So I flew right out to Las Vegas and went on his show. And he's actually reposting that episode today with the toolkit information. Um, so four things done that we thought needed to be done. And we're not done yet. We just have good motion going forward in all these things. Yeah, we decided to create a movie poster for this year. Um, we, I don't know how much the t-shirt's going to cost yet. Uh, but, I mean, we figured that this, this is uh, something that, you know, we like to have fun with things. So we do, we, we do goof around a little bit. Um, so in this picture, your a graphic, I think this is a reasonable representation of, yes, most people are vaccine accepting. That green kind of area represents about 75% of people who are willing to accept vaccines when they're offered. The 25% or, or 23% that are kind of hesitant are kind of across a continuum. And down here, maybe 1% to 2% that are anti-vaccine. Uh, what you see in my pictorial representation is that I think there's some fluidity between this these uh, groups. And I think we're seeing some results of this immersion uh, with constant social media kind of anti-vaccine movement. Um, and yes, we've banked a lot on provider recommendations, though I still think we're not as good as we need to be there. So we thought both pieces really needed to be addressed. Um, so when are people not face-to-face -face with their professional health healthcare professional? 365 days a year. That yellow wedge, which represents maybe one hour per year face to face with a healthcare professional, that yellow wedge is too big actually. But I had to make it big enough for you to see because one over 8,759, you wouldn't even be able to see it. Um, point being, you know, we need to look at both the face to face and non face to face time. Experts told us to start thinking of system level, level changes to go to the social media platforms with and to do public shaming. Literally, they told us that is the only way that you're going to see large social media platforms make changes. And that's why they made changes because it started getting into the media that they were somewhat responsible for the ill effects of um, eroding vaccine confidence. Um, and, and it's kind of getting uglier. Uh, I attribute this kind of slide to things I've heard from Angus before about the politicize, polarize, and monetize, um, right? We as humans, as I learned from communications people, we were hardwired for threat and risk. And so we see the lies of harm. And that's a, 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 a protest in Italy. Um, this was particularly ugly racism in the United States. Uh, it's almost like one of these propaganda posters from World War II. They show four Asian physicians in the US who are now all um, in po politics. And they say, that's right. They're all doctors turned politicians who are pushing draconian ma uh, mandatory vaccination and anti-parental choice legislation in the United States. Notice anything about them? Right. I mean, it just gets uglier and uglier. And then the, the monetizing, right? The magical thinking. It's time for oregano. Oregano. It's anti- pretty much everything. I, I don't know. It might be anti-Brexit. I don't know. I can't tell from that slide. Um, so what we see with the social media platforms is, yes, they're fixing some of the algorithm problems. So now that when you do a search, yeah, you're offered up more uh, factual information and sometimes with CDC or who prompts. But don't forget, they're fixing a problem they created because they monetized clickbait because that made money. So good for them for fixing that problem. Um, but the pseudoscience and conspiracies are just a further click away. Maybe it's two clicks or three quick clicks. It didn't, they didn't wipe it out. But most importantly, from our standpoint, are the, the attacks. They're, they feel horrible. You can talk to people in this room who have been attacked. It feels scary. It makes you feel vulnerable. They're meant to do those things. And um, they can be mitigated. They can be blocked if the social media platforms want to. They can allow you to filter so the people that have diametrically opposed views to uh, vaccination can be blocked from your site. They still have free speech to tell anybody who else they want to tell, but there doesn't give them a right to attack us. Um, and so we think more can be done and has to be done here. 
all the things in the toolkit talk about how to prepare and uh, defend and clean up, but how nice would it be if there wasn't an attack in the first place? So now let's talk about the power of the recommendation because we know that there's strong data showing that with a concise, clear recommendation, even hesitant people will still vaccinate the same day, 75% or so, the same day, even if they're hesitant with a con clear, concise recommendation. But the problem is you have some older docs who are like, whoa, why are you asking me questions? Just accept the vaccine. And then you have younger physicians who kind of are put back on their heels, who haven't seen the infectious disease, the vaccine preventable disease, and who are immersed already in social media and see all these fictitious but scary stories. And sometimes they're on their heels, not sure how to make the recommendation. So we really see a true erosion on the, the concise, clear recommendation being made. Now, there are two guys here in the room. Those are, those are them, Angus Thompson and John Parrish Bell. I had uh, uh, the amazing good fortune to be able to work with them, to learn from them, and to even uh, see them rolling out with the International Pediatric Association, a, a methodology called AIMS. And I understand it's one methodology, and I understand there are different types. There's motivational viewing. I know we're going to have exposure to all these. But I got to see this one rolled out. I got to be trained on it, and I got to use it in my practice, which was really great, and also talk to other people about it who've found, I, I think everybody's looking for tools. I don't think there's necessarily one right tool, but I will tell you people need tools. And the research you guys do is incredible and incredibly important. Um, so Ames is announced Inquire Mirror and Secure. We'll talk a bit further about that. Um, interestingly, though, I, I work with a lot of really business savvy pediatricians in the AAP, American Academy of Pediatrics, and they want lots of this. Every time you're in a meeting, they're like, I want a scary picture of every disease with a kid that's either really messed up or like about to die from it. That'll scare the heck out of these people. And in fact, having sat in multiple lectures and presentations, I've now found out that's the last thing you want to do with a family uh, that's hesitant. They will dig in their heels. They will actually become more hesitant and more resistant. Um, so learning what patients want and don't want is on the shoulders of what you guys do, the research that should drive what we need to do. And so um, in AIMS, um, we're using a behavioral centered approach built on trust. That slide that I showed you with two decades of building trust with the relationship where literally there's a senior doc in our group, the guy that's seen three generations who could tell you anything. I mean, he could say, eat this piece of paper. It'll make you feel better. They would eat it. I mean, this guy is, I mean, he walks on water. He would not say that. But um, the point is he uses science and evidence-based medicine and makes recommendations and people would do anything. Um, why do we squander that? Why do we not tell stories and grow and work with our families? And so we have trust. Um, we can use this behavioral centered approach and we really can come about to creating positive decision making. This is how I view AIMS that, you know, you start with a presumptive um, announcement. You know, the example I always say is uh, today Susie's going to need her TDAP, her HPV and her meningitis. But, you know, 75% uh, are say, great, done. And maybe, you know, 20 to 23% might say, well, you know, I'll take the TDAP and the menin. She needs that for school. Let's hold off on the HPV. And, and, and uh, you know, I, it, there's an instinct. Say, look, it's been going on for 10 years. It's safe. Just get it. I'm telling you, nobody's ever got sick. I said, Pull myself back a little bit <laughs> and say, well, do tell. I mean, can you tell me a little bit more? I mean, you know, look, Mrs. Jones, I, we've known each other forever. I'd, I'd love to learn a little bit more about this. You know, my, my sister-in-law posted this Facebook uh, post just literally two weeks ago, and it says the HPV vaccine sterilizes girls. And then I mirror. So I just want to make sure I get this straight. It was your sister-in-law that posted this on Facebook. You read this article, and it literally said it can sterilize kids. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what it says. So now, now she's hearing me discuss say what she said. She's, as we discussed it and as I was taught, she's feeling felt. She now knows that I know how she feels. And, and we're slowly shifting the discussion. So I'm kind of on her side of that discussion. And, and, and I can say, you know, that would, that scared the heck out of me if I thought this vaccine was going to sterilize my child. And just in that moment, she can get a sense that I, I get her fear and that I'm listening actively and that I can ask at this point, you know, I have some more information. Can I, can I tell you a little bit more about this vaccine? And I've used this now in the office and it's not 100% for me. And, and yes, we're already pretty good in the office, but I can tell you of at least three or four examples where just saying that and kind of sitting with it and then moving over to their side 
they let me talk more. And they went ahead and vaccinated. And not 100%, but I was like 75%. I, I was pretty excited. And I've lectured now and given this kind of methodology and pretty easy set of steps. And I've had other people feel empowered because they just didn't feel like they had any tools to use. Um, and if after inquiring and mirroring, sometimes like even a couple times, they're like, look, I, I just don't want, I don't want the HPV today. All right, Mrs. Jones, that's, that's fine. You're okay with the TDAP and, and Meninge. We'll get those today. And, you know, look, we can always talk about the HPV again. So we secure the relationship. It's not like, man, <laughs> you know, it's, we, we leave ourselves some room for the next time that we talk. And so I say live to vaccinate another day. And finally, winding things down, I, I view half of the issue being face-to-face, -face, right? The importance of that provider recommendation. But we're still immersed 365 days in the social media misinformation coming. And so... I think with AIMS or with whatever methodology is being taught and being used by the research that you guys are all coming up with, it's critical to empower and give healthcare providers more confidence in the way that they talk about and recommend vaccines. And we know how potent it is, but we still squander, I think, the ability to really have a, a, a clear, concise uh, uh, discussion with the vaccines. And I believe it almost kind of can dip over a little bit to the social media side, which is virtual. And to combat that, my plea every time I lecture is that healthcare providers, clinicians, scientists, researchers, all should be developing some form of virtual presence. Now, Julie and I talked about this the other day. Maybe 100% isn't the right answer. Maybe 100% of people aren't comfortable, but it's way more than there is now. And I will tell you, there's residencies in the United States. I, I know of a hospital in uh, Columbus, Nationwide Children, that, that Nationwide Children that actually teaches them how to use social media. They have a, a grand rounds once a year with a whole day dedicated to social media. They have a physician who's paid almost half time to do a, pa a podcast, and another physician who's supported to do um, Twitter and myth busting. He's an allergist. Um, so I think combined, they actually both are synergistic and make a and can make a really big difference. And, and so with that, I would say it's critically important to listen and understand, to, to fight fear with trust. And again, I think we need to do both face-to-face -face and virtual. And, and narrative and storytelling, I, I can't tell you how strong. I, 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 I will tell you one of the projects we're working on now is literally finding every hot topic issue, whether it's single parents, parents of children with special needs. We're trying to pre-identify families that fit in those categories that would be willing to go to the media with us should the opportunity arise. We're not coaching them. We just want to know when they're available because we were so lucky last time. And we're now like doing a pre-advocacy identification project. And uh, advocate, innovate, collaborate, and care. And with that, thank you very much.